Euh, donc bienvenue effectivement pour ce premier séminaire euh, de l'année universitaire euh, 2024-2025. Uh, so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Hannah Simpson. Uh, Dr. Hannah Simpson uh, is lecturer in theatre and performance at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She's the author of several, uh, several um, books on theatre and on Samuel Beckett. Samuel Beckett and the Theatre of the Witness, Pain in Post-War Francophone Drama. OUP 2022, and Samuel Beckett and Disability Performance, which she was discussing yesterday uh, in the Beckett Seminar. Uh, she works primarily on the representation of the human body on stage and politicized representations of the body more generally, and her current project explores the forgotten stage plays of modernist novelists, and this is what she's going to be talking about today, uh, about Joyce and Exiles and Harold Pinter. And so her talk will uh, probably last 40 to 45 minutes, and then we have plenty of time for a discussion. Uh, and as Madame Antonin said, we can at the end sign all your papers, okay? So we'll keep some time for that because there are a lot of you here today. So thank you for being for being here. <laughs> okay, yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I'd just like to echo what Pascal says. Thank you so much for being here on quite a grey and wet Friday morning. <laughs> you know, it's not always the easiest moment to get up and out. Um, and thank you very much to Climas for having me. Really enjoying being here and to Pascal for taking excellent care of me while I'm here. Um, so I'll begin by giving a quick bit of context for what I'm presenting today. Um, this is part of a very new book project that I'm working on that is quite tentatively entitled The Unexpected Dramatist, Modernism's Forgotten Stage Plays. And it looks at a number of really big canonical modernist novelists who at some point or another in their career wrote one, sometimes two stage plays which were absolute disasters in, in their day. Um, some of these plays did go on to have some more successful afterlives, um, in some cases after the, the author themselves, the playwright themselves, um, were dead. And I'll be thinking about one of these examples today, James Joyce's Exiles. So this is very much a work in progress. Uh, it's a very new project for me. So I'd be really interested in, in comments and questions um, whether that's on reading this specific example um, or about the, the project more broadly, thinking about um, what might make a novelist turn to uh, the stage play um, and what in these cases made them turn away from it, why these plays were, were such disasters in their day. And I think this very particular instance of Harold Pinter restaging James Joyce's play, it also raises an, an interesting question about what it means to love another author's work um, and how we engage critically or creatively with an author's work that we love. So I'm really interested here in how we might conceptualise this loving engagement um, as both a way of rendering service or homage to, to the work, but also a way of taking ownership of it in, in a way that we perhaps don't notice as, as much. I've written about this question before as regards the relationship between um, fan writing, fan fiction, and scholarly writing, and where those two genres might overlap. Um, and also on playwrights who have written sequels to Beckett's play Waiting for Godot, um, which might seem like a really audacious thing to do, to, to presume to write a sequel to, to, to Beckett's Godot. Um, so it's something I'm really interested in grappling with more broadly, the, the idea of what these forms of creative engagement, um, how they work as both acts of homage and acts of taking possession, and where our own work as scholars and academics engaging with authors' texts Sometimes authors that we love sit within this dynamic as well, how we conceptualise our role in that engagement. Um, and here specifically, and I'm very much taking a lead from Joyce's play Exiles itself, as I'll explain in a moment, um, I'm thinking about the queerly generative potential of these forms of work that, that might otherwise seem derivative um, or appropriative taking on another person's work. 
but um, I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, I'll start by st- sketching out the story of James Joyce's ill-fated 1915 play Exiles and Harold Pinter's 1970 staging of it. So James Joyce completed what would be his first and only stage play Exiles in 1915. So that is after finishing Dubliners, more or less alongside the final stages of writing A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and before beginning Ulysses. That's where it falls in his career. Exiles tells the story of Richard Ryan, an Irish writer who has returned to visit his native Dublin nine years after emigrating to Italy with Bertha, his his common-law wife, they're not actually married, and the mother of his illegitimate child. His old friend and admirer, the journalist Robert Hand, still lives in Dublin, and Robert is keen to keep Richard there in Ireland. He tells Richard, I have fought to keep a place for you here. I will fight for you still because I have faith in you, the faith of a disciple in his master. But Robert, the disciple, is also keen to seduce Richard's partner Bertha, as he's been trying to do for some years. And he now renews his efforts and Bertha tells Richard everything that passes between them. Now, in turn, Richard's response is is perhaps a little unexpected. Richard is is striving to create a relationship in which both he and Bertha are spiritually free, unbound by any social or legal convention. And he tells Bertha and, and he tells Robert that he won't stand in the way of any liaison between them. And I'll come back to the significance of Pinter choosing this specific play to work on in a moment. Um, Once it was written, Joyce struggled to have Exiles performed. Both the Stage Society of London and the Abbey Theatre in Dublin rejected it. The play text was eventually published in 1918 to very little fanfare. And the first production, if if we can call it that, in Munich in 1919 lasted only one performance before being cancelled. After that, Exiles has a 41 performance run at the Neighbourhood Playhouse in New York in 1925. Um, So interesting, you know, it's being staged in Munich and New York before it's ever staged in in Ireland or even England. Um, And then a very short two-performance London run at the Stage Society in 1926, 11 years after Joyce finished the play. Reviews of both these productions were very, very poor. Um, To quote just a few examples, the play was decried as very, very ordinary writing, uh, tedious and lacking in action, being merely three hours of talk in a single monotonous key, uh, and perhaps most damning, more ambitious than successful, as the stage put it. But then, some 50 years later, enter Harold Pinter, Pinter's 1970-1971 production of Exiles is legendary in Joyce scholarship. Pinter directed actors John Wood, um, his then wife Vivian Merchant, Timothy West and Lynn Farley in the play at Mermaid Theatre in London in 1970, where it was hailed this time as, quote, a major act of reclamation, in reviewer Michael Billington's words. And it then moved into the Royal Shakespeare Company's repertoire in 1971. The production renewed critical interest in Joyce's play, as well as marking a key moment in Pinter's own developing reputation as a director as well as a playwright. And it also illuminated the very close relationship between Joyce and Pinter's work more broadly. As Catherine Worth notes, Exiles took so easily to Pinter's direction that, as reviewers were quick to point out, it might almost have been written by him. It was common to hear people wondering whether Pinter really had written it in the sense they would explain of cutting or rearranging or, above all, of introducing un silences so as to manoeuvre it into a more Pinter-esque position. Now, in fact, as Worth goes on to explain, Pinter's direction of the play was loyal, intensely loyal, to the original play text. Pinter only cuts one very minor character and, and some associated dialogue from, from the original play text. So if Exiles itself can be read, as reviewer Irving Wardle put it, as a piece of literary vanity on Joyce's part, with the unchallenged dominance of the writer-hero at its centre, 
Richard, the protagonist, is, is a pretty transparent avatar for, for Joyce himself. Then Pinter's restaging continued this same writer-hero dominance dynamic for Joyce. This isn't a restaging that sought to rework or reorient or subvert the original text as we are perhaps more accustomed to discussing in adaptation studies. We tend to, to give more space to talking and thinking about adaptations and restagings that, that really reorient or rework the original play text. Pinter's staging of Exiles instead models a type of adaptation that plays unstinting homage to the original text, a very careful, intimate engagement that functions as, I'd argue, the adapter's attempt to get closer to a much admired hero, Pinter trying to get closer to Joyce's work through this creative engagement and this very loyal creative engagement. We know that Pinter had long seen Joyce as a literary role model from his teenage years onwards and that his fascination with Joyce's work developed over time into a really defining element of Pinter's own self-definition of a writer as he came to identify himself as one of Joyce's literary inheritors. I certainly believe I'm part of a tradition which undoubtedly includes Joyce, he would say in 1994. Joyce has always been my boy from the word go. Now I'm interested here in how in Pinter's positioning himself as Joyce's disciple here, there are simultaneous shades of ownership coming into play. From claiming a place for himself as Joyce's direct heritor to that possessive, slightly over-familiar phrase, my boy, Joyce is my boy. If we're thinking about hero worship and homage here, there's also an entwined thread of self-assertion in daring to take on this revered master's work in a creative capacity. If we turn back for a moment to reviewer Michael Billington's description of Pinter's Exiles as a major act of reclamation, there's a sense of laying claim to another author's work here. The insistent hint of possession, of ownership, tied up in this new creative intimacy with the revered author hero. And we also see some of this same strain of hero worship as possession replicated in critical commentary on Joyce's staging of Exiles. Catherine Worth continues, Pinter, one feels, must have loved the meticulousness of Joyce's stage directions. Pinter had followed his directions with exactly the same kind of scrupulous accuracy that Joyce put into devising them. To read the play with the production fresh in mind is to get an uncanny sense of two minds functioning as one. So as Worth frames it here, it is specifically Pinter's love for Joyce's work that permits this kind of possession over it. And I mean possession here in both senses of the term, possession to gain ownership over, um, and the more ghostly occupation of or exercising control over someone else, to possess someone else uh, in that sort of ghostly sense, to be possessed by a spirit or, or a ghost. This double um, sense of possession uh, creeps again and again into the language of 1970s reviews of Pinter staging. Reviewers are constantly referring to Exiles as a Pinteresque play when they review it. So Exiles becomes coded as somehow inherently Pinter's play as well as Joyce's here in a sort of reverse line of backwards inheritance or backwards haunting. This play that was written years before Pinter himself was born somehow also becomes his, becomes Pinteresque. And yet the language of Pinter doing service or homage to Joyce is also still continually entwined in responses to the restaging. The production not only reveals an extraordinary affinity between Joyce and Pinter, or Irvine Wordle muses in the times, but it also offers the kind of insight which only one creative artist can perform in the service of another. And Frank Marcus wrote for the Sunday Telegraph that Pinter has given life to a forgotten literary curiosity and this is the most profound kind of homage. So I'm suggesting that Pinter's staging of exiles offers a really useful case study for conceptualising these kind of hero worship adaptations and the odd blend of homage and ownership that drives them. 
this complicated means of getting closer to and doing service for an admired hero that shades into the taking over or the claiming of that work. As I say, in adaptation studies, there's often much more space dedicated to thinking about restagings that rework or reorient the original text that subvert or challenge or transform the meaning of that text in some way. By contrast, Pinter's restaging of exiles gives us the opportunity to think more about what I'm calling here the hero worship adaptation, both its generative and its productive qualities, and the slightly darker edges that exist in this form of intimate creative engagement. Now, I'm speaking very much in conversation here with fellow scholars Mark Taylor Batty and Vicky Mahaffey, both of whom have written in detail on Exiles and Taylor Batty on Pinter's adaptations of Exiles specifically. In particular, um, I'm borrowing Taylor Batty's idea of how directing or restaging another artist's work is, quote, a form of surrogate authorship in the theatre particularly when a disciple or a self-identified disciple takes on the work of a master, as when Pinter approaches Joyce's work. Here's Taylor Batty's reading of Pinter's approach to exiles. When considering what attracted Pinter to the notion of resurrecting exiles for the stage, in the first instance, there must have been a very simple allure in tackling this master's only stage play. One might conclude that it was by engaging in these shared artistic concerns through the act of directing, a form of surrogate authorship in the theatre, that Pinter sought to engage his own creativity. Now, Taylor Batty, throughout the rest of this chapter, is primarily interested in the really positive, wholesome dimensions of this surrogate author relationship. This form of influence, this form of impact, he argues, can be thought of, a thought of as a process of, quote, absorption, dilution, and refinement within the receiving artist. It is not, he says, the parasitic lifting and appropriation of ideas or structures, nor is it the homage-paying urge to repeat and replicate. I think there's actually something darker and something queerer uh, going on here, particularly in the context of Joyce's play, which is about itself forms of possession, intimacy and betrayal. And the fact that Pinter selects himself this really darkly unsettling play as a channel for getting closer to Joyce and Joyce's work. Although she doesn't write specifically on Pinter's production of Exiles, Vicky Mahaffey also thinks carefully about the troubling, elusive darkness of love in Joyce's work in relation to Joyce's own appropriative tendency, um, his, his own tendency to appropriate styles and figures from other people's work, or what she calls his characteristic readiness to appropriate the styles and voices of other writers. I'll read this quotation in full because it's quite, it's quite complex in itself. So Mahaffey says, whereas in Joyce's most famous works, this appropriative tendency takes the form of parody or emerges through correspondences, in his slighter pieces, it has been dismissed as simply derivative. All writing, of course, is derivative. The question that presses is whether a work represents a productive or a reiterative, repetitive reading of its sources. Does it replicate the most familiar features of its parent texts, or does it shape our awareness of those texts? It is not purely on their own terms that these documents lay claim to our attention. Their value stems largely from their incestuous relationship to other writing. So Mahaffey acknowledges the, the, these darker elements to this, this reiterative, this derivative, this appropriative kind of writing, but she pushes us to find a value in these kinds of incestuous relationships um, where the reiterative or the derivative becomes productive in Joyce's own work. So I want to pick up on the hints here in Taylor Batty's term, surrogate authorship, and Mahaffey's reading of the incestuous and the appropriate of love in Joyce's own style, in order to offer a new queer inflected reading of Pinter's hero worship adaptation of Exiles. Both Taylor Batty and Mahaffey turned to the language of alternative sexualities and displaced sexual reproduction 
the surrogate authorship to describe the really generative potential of these vicarious or reiterative forms of creative work. And I think we can extend this framework to think more closely about Pinter's engagement with Joyce's play and the unusual forms of productivity that it occasions and the uncanny ways that this mingling of writing, of love, of homage and of queer forms of sexuality are mirrored in the play text itself. So I'm going to focus the second half of this talk now on laying out how Exiles itself models literary work, writing, reading, and sexual relationships shaded with homoerotic desire and issues of acquisitive authorship. How Pinter's own comments on Joyce and Exiles mirrors this homoerotic aligning of bodily encounter and becoming and how Pinter's adaptation of Exiles occasions some further non-normative literary fertility, a queer medley of ghostly rebirth in Pinter's own subsequent career. So as I've said, there are parallels here with the action of the Exiles playtext itself, in which Richard's self-described disciple, Robert, also seeks to take carnal possession of the hero's wife, as a means, very clearly in the playtext, of getting closer to Richard himself. This is one of the reasons he offers for wanting to engage in a liaison with Bertha. Several critics have already commented on the latent homoeroticism in Richard and Robert's relationship in Exiles. Robert's desire for Bertha and Richard's own seeming desire for Bertha and Robert to consummate their mutual attraction triangulates the two men in a form of displaced, vicarious sexual encounter. The two men touch often, and often sensually, when they're talking about Bertha, and they express this desire repeatedly to be more deeply united together. Robert says, you are the incarnation of strength. Richard holds out his hands, feel these hands. Robert taking his hands says, yes. Richard says, at that moment, I felt our whole life together in the past, and I longed to put my arm around your neck. Later, Richard, um, talking about, his, about Bertha, says, in the core of my ignoble heart, I longed to be betrayed by you and by her, in the dark, in the night, secretly, meanly, craftily. By you, my best friend, and by her, I longed for that. Robert bends down, places his hand over Richard's mouth, says, enough, enough, takes his hand away, but no, go on, say more. In this final example in particular, alongside this really intimate touch between Robert's hand and Richard's mouth, we also get this very clear allusion to how Robert's carnal possession of Richard's wife, Bertha, would bring the two men closer together. Richard speaks elsewhere of his desire for Bertha as being driven by his feelings for Richard, telling him, you are so strong, you attract me even through her. There are hints that, that, that are never made explicit, but there are hints that the two men may have shared sexual activity in the past, in our wild nights long ago, as Robert recalls, in the shared cottage they kept together, and to which Robert now invites Bertha to that same cottage in the play. And Bertha herself acknowledges her role as a channel between the two men. Speaking to Richard later of her evening tryst with Robert, remember she tells Richard everything that passes between her and Robert, Bertha explains, I wanted to bring you closer together, you and him. She recognises her own role here very explicitly. Joyce's own notes to Exiles expand more explicitly on this homoerotic dynamic. He writes that Bertha wishes for the spiritual union of Richard and Robert and believes that this union will be affected only through her body. The bodily possession of Bertha by Robert, repeated often, would certainly bring into an almost carnal contact the two men. Do they desire this? Joyce is sort of figuring out his own thinking about the play here. He's writing these questions to himself. Do they desire this? to be united, that is, carnally, through the person and body of Bertha, as they cannot, without dissatisfaction and degradation, be united carnally, man to man, as man to woman. Remember Joyce's writing in the 1910s here. Bertha is the channel that allows for the vicarious queer coupling of Robert and Richard themselves. 
Beyond this idea that Bertha and Robert might be united sexually through Bertha, however, the play also suggests that this triangulated relationship engages them in a form of shared literary creation. It's, it's worth remembering here that Richard and Robert are both writers. Um, Richard is a writer and a literary personality, um, up for a job in the literary faculty at, at, at Trinity College Dublin, and Robert is a journalist. They're, they're both writers. Bertha is positioned throughout the play as a kind of written entity, spoken of repeatedly as a kind of, quote, work forged by Richard. Robert describes Richard as having created Bertha. He says, she is yours, your work. And to return to this line quoted a moment ago, it is specifically Bertha's perceived existence as Richard's creation that draws Robert to her. She is yours, your work, you are so strong that you, she, you, that you attract me even through her. So the framework in this play merges literary creation, sexuality, and embodied homage together. Robert is a very long time admirer of Richard's literary work too, but his admiration here takes on a sexualized embodied dimension. A kiss is an act of homage, Robert proclaims very early in the play, but if he admires Bertha as Richard's work, then his kissing her is an homage to Richard, not to Bertha herself within this framework. Now, Pinter's own discussion of his relationship to Joyce's work, and particularly to Exiles, replicates this same yearning to embody an otherwise impossible to embody relationship. Pinter repeatedly speaks of his affection for Joyce's writing in really intriguingly intimate and embodied terms. He says, I read Ulysses every night before I go to bed, he tells us. I don't believe him. I do not believe anybody does that. Um, and I certainly had a wonderful relationship with James Joyce. Unfortunately, it was never embodied for obvious reasons. But I always thought I would have loved to have had a drink with him. I would have loved him to have seen my production of Exiles. To have a drink with Joyce and then to take him to bed. Pinter writes his relationship with Joyce's work in these cosy, nearly flirtatious terms, the channel to an embodied relationship that is otherwise impossible. And Pinter's own production of Exiles itself sits intriguingly as an embodied way of, of, of making this connection. If Robert, in Exiles, uh, blends the language of kissing and paying homage, Pinter here emphasizes a similarly embodied, even gently eroticized dynamic in his own relationship with Joyce. He chooses this play to restage, this play in which two men form a vicarious erotic relationship through sexual encounter with the same woman as piece of creative work. And then he describes his relationship with Joyce in these same terms. We might say that Joyce's play scripts a model of displaced, vicarious love that Pinter then takes up and follows by staging that play itself. And critical commentary has in turn followed the same model as we've seen in speaking so recurrently of Pinter's production as a merging of the two men, this product of affinity, love, two writers functioning as one. In Exiles, both men acknowledge the idea that Bertha, as initially Richard's creation, could become Robert's by dint of his sexual encounter with her or through his love for her. You may be his and mine, he says. You may be his, sorry, Richard says, you may be his more than mine, Richard tells Bertha, pondering her possible liaison with Robert. Bertha becoming more Robert's possession than his. Each man going to work on Bertha, both men loving Bertha, might produce a dual possession of her, or even a transfer of ownership. And so too we find exiles discussed as Pinteresque in those 1970s reviews. I'm going to make a really brief side note here, which, which may be quite a tenuous link. This is... Um, something I don't know what to do with, and I'm still thinking through. There's a period of time in late 1971 and early 1972 when Exiles is running at the Aldwych Theatre in London, 
with Pinter's then wife, Vivian Merchant, playing the wife Bertha. So Pinter's wife is, is playing Bertha. And at the same time, Pinter's own play, Old Times, and that title is taken directly from Exiles, I'll talk about that in a moment, was also playing at the Albitch Theatre in London with Pinter's then wife, Vivian Merchant, playing the wife Anna. I don't know what to do with this just yet, <laughs> but there is something really intriguing here about, again, we get this body of the woman, the wife, Pinter's literal wife, connecting these two men across these two stage plays. Um, there's another weird sort of ghostly mirroring going on here about how this woman connects these, these two men's work in a very embodied way. She's the actor on stage performing the, these two wives. Um, this is Vivian Merchant on stage with, with their son. If anyone has thoughts about that, I'd love to hear more. <laughs> but to return more specifically to Mark Taylor Batty and Vicky Mahaffey's language of non-normative displaced forms of reproduction, surrogate authorship and the incestuous reiterative or derivative yet productive sexual encounter. So we have this language of displaced, even taboo sexual fertility used to describe literary creation across both Taylor Batty and Mahaffey's work. And it maps on to this question of ownership and over-intimacy that we can trace in Joyce's playtext and in Pinter's engagement with it. Exiles as a play is really troubled by the question of procreativity, um, of, of giving life through giving birth. Richard and Bertha's son, Archie, is illegitimate. The two never married, although they live together and, and have for a long time as man and wife. And Joyce's manuscript notes delve in detail into exactly what extramarital sexual act might have been performed by Bertha and Robert in order to avoid a second unwanted pregnancy during their own illicit evening tryst in the cottage. This is really quite, um, quite subtle for Joyce, really. Those of you who know Joyce's writing will appreciate um, how, how subtle he actually is here. Joyce writes, again, in his notes to the play, where he's thinking through the, the play itself, he says, Bertha is reluctant in, in meeting with Robert to give the hospitality of her womb to Robert's seed doesn't want to be impregnated again by this man. Would she allow her lust to carry her so far as to receive the emission of seed in any other opening of his body where it could not be acted upon once emitted by the forces of her own secret flesh? So citing Bertha's fear of being impregnated by Robert, Joyce muses over the possibility that the two could engage in anal sex or in, quote, the accomplishment of the act otherwise externally by friction or in the mouth. There's another hint of homoeroticism here, Bertha and Robert's very choice of sexual act paralleling that which would be available to Robert and Richard um, rather than the coitus that is available only to man and woman. Yet the sexual encounter is still shaded with this fear of procreation, the fear of illegitimate reproductive fertility, than the very specific reason for the choice of specific sex act, sex act. We are reminded that Bertha has already borne one illegitimate child from Richard, and Robert muses at the play's end that Archie could be, or could have been, his son in another queer, vicarious link with Richard. Looking at Archie, he says, perhaps there, Richard, is the freedom we seek, seek if he were mine, if that were my son. Indeed, Robert's final line in the play, um, as he exits the stage hand in hand with Archie, has him telling the child, I am your fairy godfather. So the line merges both vicarious fatherhood and queer identity. The word fairy having doubled as derogatory slang for a gay man since the 1890s. So Exiles the Play offers queer displaced forms of procreation of vicarious reproductive fertility, both men sharing one woman and then one child in an imaginative sense. And Pinter's staging of exiles results in a similar form of what we might also conceptualize as displaced or queered creative fertility. 
Pinter's staging very literally revived Joyce's play, resurrecting it in both the popular and the critical imagination. It gave life to this maligned and forgotten play text. If, if you look back in Joyce scholarship, there's, there's almost nothing written on exiles before the 1970s. Scholars tended to ignore it. And birthing a new wave of stagings and scholarly writings about exiles itself. To return to my earlier metaphor of possession, of ghostly possession, the reverse haunting of Joyce's play. So 1970s reviews of the production repeatedly baptise exiles as Pinteresque, yes, and they also repeatedly turn to this trope of resurrected life or rekindled life, the play being raised from the dead. We might think back to this quotation from Frank Marcus who, when he declares that Pinter has given life to exiles. And David Marowitz wrote for the Village Voice that Pinter had lifted the lid of the coffin of one of the greatest plays of our time, reviving a masterpiece that has been buried under the dead weight of traditional response for 50 years. So there's a temporal queering at work here too, or a queering of the more common metaphor of literary creativity. Rather than bringing to life, Pinter brings back to life, not fathering, but refathering. This unsettling trope of the reawakened dead merges with exile's own concern with illegitimate or displaced or vicarious fathering. And in turn, Pinter's engagement with exiles reawakened his own literary creativity. In the late 1960s, Pinter had entered a period of creative stagnation, as he admitted in his acceptance speech for the German Shakespeare Prize in 1970, telling his audience, I am writing nothing and I can write nothing. You can save that for midway through term. I'm writing nothing and I can write nothing. Staging exiles marked the beginning of a renewed period of creative activity for Pinter in the 1970s when he began writing again himself. And several scholars have noted the very direct influence of the details of exiles on Pinter's own subsequent play texts, particularly Old Times, which as I've mentioned, that title is a direct quotation from Exiles and the play Betrayal. Indeed, David G. Wright and Ronald Knowles have both found examples of Pinter directly quoting lines from Exiles in other plays and in interviews when he's speaking as himself, um, word for word in some cases more than a decade later he's still repeating these verbatim lines from the play. This complicates Mark Taylor Batty's assertion that Joyce's influence on Pinter, quote, is not the parasitic lifting and appropriation of ideas or structures, nor is it the homage paying urge to repeat and replicate. And I, I'd suggest that Taylor Batty's very specific denial of this occurring perhaps exposes an anxiety on, on his part that this is something that does happen. He, he protests a little too much here, I think. Pinter does, in fact, repeat and replicate in paying homage to Joyce, both in restaging his play, rather than one of Pinter's own, for example, and still more literally in repeating lines from the play across his later work and discussion. But I don't think we need to see Pinter's queer rebirthing of Joyce's work in a negative sense because of this. Vicky Mahaffey's reading of Joyce's own appropriative, derivative writing methods give us an excellent model of thinking about how you might read the appropriative and the derivative as productive, as creative, as building something new. As I've said, I, I think we have a tendency to focus more on the subversive or the resistant adaptation as a form of real creativity and to ignore the apparently less generative straight staging, um, these, these adaptations that superficially seem to do less with, with the original play text. And this has prevented us in many cases from focusing due attention on these hero worship forms of engagement. We struggle to see sometimes how the derivative might also occasion legitimate artistic creativity. And to end on, on what is still a slightly speculative note, I really struggle to believe that Pinter himself wasn't conscious of these questions in choosing to work in such depth on a play like Exiles, a play that is itself intensely concerned with these issues of the disciple-master relationship and of the tangled dynamics of creation and control. 
Exiles itself offers a very useful lens for reading Pinter's restaging in its modelling of various forms of queer allegiance, vicarious modes of creative encounter, and attendant anxieties about illegitimacy, inheritance, and ownership. In some reading Pinter's staging of Exiles through the action of Exiles itself as a play concerned with queer acquisitive forms of love allows us to tease out some of the anxieties that circle around Pinter's restaging and around hero worship adaptations more generally. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was really uh, fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions and then I'll um, ask the audience if they have any questions. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty. Um, but just to start off, um, I was struck by the fact that you haven't shown any stills or pictures of the adaptation. Are there no archives of, or you know, uh, pictures of, of how it was then in 1971? There are a few. Um, they're not wonderful quality, as you might imagine. I think one thing that, 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 that is interesting um, is how um, dated the staging of the, of the production looks. I mean, this, you know, this is a 1910s play. It is a drawing room play. In, in a lot of senses, you know, you, a lot of the action is literally in the drawing room of this home. Um, you have these characters coming and going with their servant coming in and out. And Pinter does stage it very much in that style of the ruffled dresses. And, and it, it all looks very mannered and very lovely. Um, and I think if you were to look at, the, if you looked at the staging, you would not get this sense of this incredibly modern um, play text that, that is happening. It, it's interesting in itself that, that Pinter sticks with that staging rather than again trying to update or, or rework that in any sense. Yeah, so then when he does that in old times or betra betrayal, mm -hmm. it's a sort of take on Joyce, but a modern take in a way? Very much so, yeah. yeah. yeah the same scenario, but played out in, in, in modern life, yeah. And it's also very striking how uh, what in the play Exiles echoes what happened in Pinter's life. He was, you know, betrayal is based on his own life, mm. where he had this affair for a long time with another woman whom he finally married. And so the triangular uh, situation you described was also in Pinter's own life. Yes. So I don't, maybe, I mean, is that a way into answering one of the questions that you asked about um, the, you know, the, the role of uh, Vivian Merchant? Maybe? Yes. I, I mean, I think these, these sort of the... I, su I suppose one of the... Um, I don't quite mean simpler answers for choosing Exiles, because for, sorry, for, for Pinter choosing Exiles to stage, because it's still a weird decision um, to stage this play that is about an extramarital affair um, Pinter has so many extramarital affairs. <laughs> you know, one of the big ones is is um, if we can just go back to her image, um, Vivian Merchant, his wife. He he ends up leaving um, as a, as part of a long running extramarital affair. So I suppose the you know in, in terms of thinking about well why does Pinter stage this play? Well, there's one reason there. It, it's speaking to something that's going on in his personal life. Um, the reason I say that's not a simple answer is because that's still a really strange choice, sort of telling on yourself um, um, in that sense. But again, it makes Vivian's role here as this sort of embodied figure really intriguing as uh, uh, this sort of... I don't quite want to say lost. Vivian Merchant is an incredibly famous actor in her own right. But again, this figure who sort of um, is an embodied figure on this stage playing these... Um, betrayed wives or betraying women while this is also going on in, in her own life. It's, it's such a muddy... I still don't know what to do with it. There's something really obvious there. <laughs> I don't, unless the chapter becomes entirely about Vivian. I, I, I don't know what to say about her. And I also was surprised that you didn't talk about Beckett, really, because <laughs> <laughs> that's another triangular kind of relationship between uh, Beckett, Joyce and Pinter. Uh, Beckett being in the middle, really, Joyce, mm. Beckett, and Pinter, uh, because Beckett knew Joyce, whereas Pinter didn't, as mm. you um, quoted. And I remember from reading Beckett's letters that uh, they exchanged letters with Pinter uh, about the production and the uh, mise en scène mm. of uh, the staging of um, Exiles. And that I don't know if you remember this, that Beckett had some, you know, insight into how to 
produce it. And, uh, yes. So maybe there's, and of course, um, Beckett was, well, Pinter uh, admired Beckett a lot. Mm. And so there's sort of reproduction of the, the relationship between, <laughs> with, with, you know, both Beckett admiring Joyce and, and uh, Pinter admiring Joyce, but vicariously. Yes, yes. I mean, certainly if we're thinking about disciple-master relationships, that, that relationship between Joyce and Beckett is, at least initially, really clearly a, a, a disciple-master relationship. Um, both, yes, in terms of sort of the admiration for, for an author hero, but also the, the literary work that, that, that Beckett is doing for Joyce as a young man, the transcribing of, of his work and so on is another very interesting embodied question as to how Beckett fits within Joyce's work. If he's transcribing the work of Joyce, he is literally writing it, but not authoring it in the, in the sense that, that we might understand authorship. So that question of how that line of inheritance actually includes Beckett as well as, as well as Pinter, and yes, is one of the ways, is one of the channels that, that Pinter is able to get close to Joyce by talking to Beckett, who did know him, who did have an embodied relationship with him. Um, I, al I also quite like in that letter that, that um, Beckett is so, not so keen, it's all relative <laughs> in Beckett's letters and Beckett's level of enthusiasm, but that he is really saying to, to Pinter, I can see this play working. Uh -huh. this, this could work, it, it hasn't worked before, um, but here are ways to potentially do it. This, this could work as a, as a stage play. Yeah. Okay, and I have one last question, um, which is maybe more general and then I'll open up to the floor. Um, there's one quote uh, by um, F. Marcus uh, in 1970, uh, saying that the play is a literary curiosity. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I mean, is, does that, um, <laughs> is that what you're looking at with the other plays you're working with for this book, new book, or it, you wouldn't use that phrase? I think, I think when I began it, um, yes, I absolutely would have. I, I mean, quite literally, I was curious about these plays as... as um, you know, the, the, to, to give some context here, the, the writers in question that I'm looking at are um, Virginia Woolf, George Orwell, E.M. Um, e. Foster, James Joyce, Flann O'Brien, um, Elizabeth Bowen, and William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, and um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. So they're huge names, you know, they're big modernist novelist names. But the plays are so untalked about. Exiles is actually one of the most famous relatively speaking. Um, but, you know, th there are plenty of, of American literary scholars who will, you know, absolutely say, what do, you, what do you mean Hemingway's play? Or, you know, what do you mean George Orwell's play? Um, so initially, just sort of curiosity of, of sort of going, well, hang on, what's going on in these plays? Why haven't I heard about them? Why for authors who's, you know, we write and write and write about and teach and teach on, why, why have we not mined this already? Um, but the more I get into it, and, and honestly, some of them are bad plays. <laughs> some of them are not good plays. You have novelists who are very good at, at being novelists, writing, trying to write plays. Um, but the more I get into it, the more the, the sort of that, that curiosity is led into thinking about um, either for something like Exiles, the really complex place it has in the development of modern drama, the lines of influence that, that it has that, that hasn't been recognised, um, or the work that these plays are, are doing in their own right. Um, Fitzgerald's play, for example, um, is, is, is fascinating. If I, if I had more funding, I, I would have staged it already. It looks at a, um, a very ordinary man. He's a postman. Um, and through some shady wheelings and dealings, he becomes president of the United States. <laughs> and everything is very corrupt, and he nearly sets off World War Three. And then he gets indicted. You just go, well, hang on. <laughs> this play has something to say to us. <laughs> you know? So increasingly, I'm, I'm finding myself really interested in, in the plays themselves, um, alongside this broader question of why are these novelists turning to the stage? What's the allure of, of, of what the stage medium can do for them or what they think it can do for them that, that, that the novel genre can't? Okay, well, thank you very much. And so I'll open up to the, the room, uh, to the floor. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe I don't, it's probably not necessary. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so actually, two questions at different time. One of which is really kind of a pragmatic question. I mean, what were the initial rejections of the play 
based on? And, and do we have the documentation of those rejections at, at the time? Is it a moral question? Is it a writing question? Is it a combination? Or? The stage society very much seems to be on, on quality. They do, it's, it's very brief. It's very um, anonymous. It's just them sort of going, no, no thank you. The Abbey Theatre is far more bound up in this is not Irish enough for us. This is not going to sell to our audience. Um, you know, and, and the play is you know, a, a bit that doesn't fit in, in, in this, this analysis at all, but the play is really interested in what it is to, you know, for Richard to be in exile, to be returning home, the reasons he's left Ireland in the first place. It is very interested in, in his sort of role in the nation state at that point, but it's certainly not that sort of, at that point, Abbey play, sing and the peasants and that sort of version of, of, of creating a, a, a kind of national theatre of Ireland at that point. So it seems very bound up in um, in, the, in the Abbey Theatre saying it, it's not our kind of Irish play, actually. Mm -hmm. And the second question, which you've got me really intrigued, um, both on the question of, of Bertha and on her depiction by the Merchant. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like, what does the scholarship say about the character of Bertha? You know, her own agency, her own uh, sexuality, her own sexual identity? Mm -hmm. And then, and then, of course, that can tie into the depiction, the dual depictions in, in 71 with, with both plays of, of how pictures saw <coughs> this particular actress. And again, so, so is she only a vessel for the relationship between the two men? Mm. Or is she you know, expressing something greater than that or, or different than that as, as an agent in and of herself? Yeah, yeah. Um. I'm going to try and answer in two parts, so remind me to come back to the second part if I don't get to. I, th I think one thing that, that, that I really need to do here actually is thinking about going into more detailed research about, I don't quite mean the kind of actor that Vivian Merchant was, but the way she was read as an actor at that point. Um, why would you cast Vivian Merchant in, in certain kind of roles? What, what did she connote? I'm sort of thinking about... Um, Trying to think of an example now. Um, for example, when you cast um, Fiona Shaw in a role, what are you casting her for? You're casting her for a sort of gravitas, a sort of dignity, a kind of authority on the stage. I currently don't have a sense of how Vivian Merchant sits um, as, as a sort of recognised actor at that point. What kind of roles is she known for playing? And do these roles kind of feed into that or not? So thinking about how casting her might tell us more about how... Bertha is appearing or being read at, th at that point. Um, and the second half of my answer is going to be, yes. Um, in terms of sort of critical readings of Bertha, um, really, really complicated. I mean, I think there is a, you, you, you can probably tell from some of the quotations there that, that there's a lot in Joyce's depiction of her that, that we might find objectionable. She really is, you know, there would be a reading of this play that said she's a vessel, she's not given her own agency, she, she's there as a sort of, sexual channel and and that's it um a lot of a lot of early critical readings of the play have followed that they read her as a, as, a, as a body as a, as a sexual being as, as a sort of secondary character um I, d I don't think that's really true of the play there's a lot that's very very interesting a, a, about birth and the way she develops um throughout the play and the way she responds to other female characters in the play um and some later scholarship has started to pick up on that more interestingly. But it's, it's really underdeveloped in terms of the reading of, of where Bertha sits in that play. I think precisely because it's so complicated. Um, you, you could read one scene and have one idea of how Joyce depicts her and read another scene and, and have a completely different idea. So there's one of the back and Mm. That's a really good question and sort of gets at the heart of, of, of this project. Um, my response right now, and it, again I need to think more about this, my response right now is that it's more a change in audience reception. Um, 
there's a way there's a way of reading this play that, that might sound a bit flippant because it's the way we read a lot of Joyce's work, but I think it's true. It's more modern than a lot of what is going on around it at the time. It's a really, you know, if it's a drawing room play, it's an incredibly unsettling, ambiguous one. The ending is incredibly ambivalent. Um, and not to sort of say that, oh, 1970s audiences were more discerning or could see the value of this, but were much, you know, by the 1970s, that's not an odd thing to be seeing in the theatre, to be seeing a sort of ambiguous, very modern um, piece of work that this play is asking its 1910s audiences to work far harder in accepting it and understanding it and, and not, you know, 1910s, we're still, we're still looking at, okay, Ibsen is sort of bringing in more ambivalence and so on, but he still likes a beautifully structured play with, with an ending and everything very neat, etc. We're still staging a lot of, a lot of, you know, wild, nice, neat, three acts and one so forth. So it's not to sort of go, oh, 1970s audiences understood it and saw the value of it, but they're much readier to, to meet it. The horizon of expectations there is, is much clearer. Um, th that, to me, m sits as one of the key things, actually, in terms of rather than anything that Pinter is doing to change it. Yeah. For me, it would be like uh, accepting to play on, on these plays. Uh, it's like uh, trying to save her marriage. Mm -hmm. Like um, trying to please her husband because she knows that she's going to be like the connection between her and the things he, he loves. You know, yes. Like Joyce and, and his play and everything. So maybe it was like a trying to, you know. Yes. Uh, if we're thinking about love and creative engagement, there is another version of of let me let me be a creative part of of this this play you love and this man you love and uh, and so on yeah um yeah because it, it it's also i mean th thinking really specifically about exiles it's quite an interesting role to take on as and, and again i don't want to sort of make too many assumptions of vivian as a betrayed wife and and, and so on but it is quite interesting because in this role she is ostensibly the betrayer you actually get to play the role of betraying the husband, although really crucially, it is left. We are not entirely certain at the end of the play whether or not she has consummated her relationship with, with Robert. She goes to the cottage, certainly, um, and something happens. We don't know. So there's also a sort of weird move there in kind of getting to do the other role as well. You are... You, you are um, you know, literally under your husband's direction and taking on this play and acting against that channel. Um, but it's also offering a slightly different role in terms of I am the wife who betrays, potentially, as opposed to the wife who is betrayed. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm, yes. Writing, you find very much the same kind of triangular relationship, the same master-disciple relationship too, the, the master being a famous author, the disciple being a journalist, you know, mm -hmm. lots and lots of things that actually echo with uh, the, the plate set. Yes. So, you know, it's, it's more like a comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also about, um, uh, the, so the plate set, it seemed to me when you first uh, gave us a summary of the play, I thought of Bertha myself as some kind of mute. Mm -hmm. you know, the mute that anyone indeed is likely to appropriate in a, to a certain extent. And to me, choice was kind of opening the play for future writers to appropriate his work, saying, yeah, all right, you can have her. You know? <laughs> yes. Okay, she's you can also create something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, with her. I don't know if you think this is also a possible interpretation. Yeah, and it's a nice way, and, and, and I'd like to come back to your, to your idea about sort of Joyce as disciple in, in this line as well. But it's also, it's an interesting move when we think about what it means to turn to theatre writing or stage writing as well, where as a writer, as a playwright, you do give up far more control over your piece of writing than in prose. 
So to get it staged, you you know, you very literally have to hand it over to to the theatre, to the theatre company, to the director, to the actors, etc. It's it's immediately, you know, even even if you are a sort of quite stringent writer in the rehearsal room, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you immediately are giving that that control over. So I think that idea of sort of giving it over is is very literally true in, in turning to the stage there let alone the idea that you know you hope there will be subsequent productions and so on and so forth that the, the, the play text is far less stable than 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 your prose text broadly speaking um i think your point about about um joyce and james is really interesting the other figure there is is ibsen who again if we're sort of looking at those those lines where um where Pinter talks about himself as, as Joyce's disciple, Joyce is so positioning himself as Ibsen's disciple in a really painful way sometimes, you know, that very painful young man Joyce way. You know, he's writing to Ibsen and saying, I am your inheritor. I am the one who is, who is um, fighting for your work in Ireland. Um, I am the one who's going to take modern drama forward. Um, and so I think the influences of, of sort of Ibsen's realist style on, on the play are very clear. So I think absolutely there's so much space to read. The way Pinter is positioning himself as disciple is in itself a model of the way Joyce is, is positioning himself as, as disciple there as well. Um, I don't know where this chapter starts and ends. <laughs> I could just keep going backwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, I was uh, very surprised when you described the play as two years <laughs> and uh, it turned into a success through Pinch's Magic. Mm. And uh, I was, uh, well, this is uh, fascinating to me um, because I doubt that um, uh, Gerald's play, The Vegetable, could be turned into uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a success. In, uh, in similar terms. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the, well, the first, uh, what is, in your opinion, the reason for this? Well, I think that what you said about the time, that the fact that it was very, so inoperative, that it didn't make sense to, mm. to the contemporary uh, audience. But, uh, I, I find it was really very bad. So <laughs> it, it was a terrible experience. <laughs> I realised that it's far more difficult to write an article about uh, a, a, let's say it's a bad uh, text yes. uh, than on a rich one. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a series of comments that I wanted to make and I wanted to hear about your reactions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've sort of been interested in um, in sort of starting to talk about this 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 project in public and um, and in pitching for research grants <laughs> in order to write the project. But the things that I initially thought were interesting about the project not being the things that other people have found interesting. And one of the one of the big themes that people are reading in the project as interesting is how we conceptualize literary failure which I suppose sounds a little bit obvious and I should have noticed that myself <laughs> talking about plays, plays that were that were failures. Um, but actually the fact that we don't have a very clear framework for thinking about literary failures and literary failures that turn into success um, in a way that, you know, in the in the in the real world we we talk all the you know, we're constantly reviewing books and, and thinking about what we like and don't like and is the second novel a failure and does it live up to the first and so on and so forth. So it, it, it's actually, and, and you know, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, it's, it's one of the things that I'm, I've come quite lately to, to thinking about through the project of going, actually, is this a project about literary failure and how we conceive of that, rather than, or, or alongside um, this question of turning to the stage and why, why one would, would turn to the stage. Um, and, and, and actually sort of really grappling to find to find useful sources, to find useful frameworks, to sort of push my way, my way of, of thinking about that. It's, it's been one of the, the sort of tricky moments that, that, I, that I'm still sitting in, I think. But you know that Gerald introduced uh, dramatic passages in the novel. Mm -hmm. There was really this attraction. Yeah, he wanted to write, he really wanted to, to 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And um, well, after that, it, it gave up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's interesting. But I, I see what you mm. mean, but I think no matter uh, in the 22nd century, I think it's still there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sort of what you're saying there is making me think about also Fitzgerald moving to um, cinema and and screenwriting in that sense. Which and, and, and I'm not I'm not the person to to talk on that. I do, I don't know his, his screenwriting nearly as well. Um, to me, the narrative around that is very much it, it's for money. It, it's it's for survival at, at that point, as opposed to any sort of. Um, pull towards the theatre in the way that, that, you know, as you're saying, you can even see in the novels to that extent where do those sort of dramatic elements come in as well. Um, I, I did have someone suggest that, that, that this sort of the, about the project said, well, the, the turn to theatre is the turn for money. It, 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 it's a way of making money. I think anyone that works in the theatre knows <laughs> so that if that's your motivation for working in the theatre, you're, you're probably not going to last very long. But, <laughs> but I've kept it in the back of my mind as, as a warning. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, may I pitch in right now? Yeah, I was just thinking when, while listening to you that maybe one of the reasons for the success of Exiles in, in the 1970s was not only the timing and uh, the reception, but also the fact that you know uh, Pinter was very popular at the time and he was already a successful playwright, mm. and uh, so he brought his cultural capital to uh, the play in a way. So it was a sort of mm. shifting of translation of capital uh, from, you know, this big novelist, but not a playwright, and this playwright, not a novelist. Yes. Um, he was, you know, he, he was unsuccessful in, in the, the prose, uh, mm -hmm. Pinter. So I was just wondering about that, and, um, and something else that I just forgot. So yeah, <laughs> I'll just <laughs> leave it there, yeah. sorry. And, and where, where Joyce is sitting at that point as well. I mean, obviously, sort of 1915, Joyce is getting known but is, is not going to be a huge pool to the theatre. Now that becomes more interesting, I think, when you look at those 20s um, stagings where you, you are sort of in the peak of, of, of Ulysses' madness. That is still very different to, you know, to me there's still space there for, for the kind of tall poppy syndrome as, oh, he's had all the success with this novel, can he pull off the play? Oh, we're sort of delighted if he can't, you know, versus, uh, you know, in the 1970s going, ah, yes, Joyce. Of course, it will be good or interesting. Or yeah, yeah, and uh, what I just remembered what I wanted to say, <laughs> uh, and also the fact that you know Pinter being this uh, cet homme de théâtre, so he knew what he was doing, yeah. whereas Joyce didn't probably, you know. Yeah. So that you know made probably made a difference as well. I mean, it's just yeah, kind of obvious. So, are there any questions? Yes. Oh, okay, plenty. So, please. <laughs> sure. I guess the question about the larger project is one of the things that of the the writers that. You a lot of them seem to have turned to theater very early on. Mm -hmm. so it's a kind of grappling to try to find a form. And the only exception seems to be the wolf, right? It's kind of between mm -hmm. the acts, it's kind of late. Thing. But the other is like Orwell, he's unknown, what do you mean? Yeah. Foster would would be the other later. Yeah. Um, sure, but, I mean, but I see, I see your broad point. And yeah. else, right? So I guess there's a question of whether or not this kind of like turn to theater is a kind of early discovery, like just like, you know, mm -hmm. writer might dabble in poetry and whatever else, right? So the canonical works haven't appeared yet, right? Yes. Uh, so in some sense, the theater is an early exploration in the form mm. and whatever else. Whether that's something that you're thinking about. Yeah. I'm also thinking about other kind of, you know, great name modernists, right? Like Lawrence wrote lots of plays mm -hmm. and novels at the same time, and they juggled it, right? You could yeah. Like Woodhouse. Kind of real. Well, that's what you go to the for money, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, we're able to write novels and plays and just like alternate, right, between one and the other. Thomas Bernhardt. Mm. Kind of stuff, right? Yes, Joseph Conrad. Yeah, Conrad, yeah. Right, yeah. Adaptations of his novels. Yeah. This is sort of, the, the, there's a kind of margin of, of people who could have been in this project, but they were a little bit too good. <laughs> they weren't, they didn't quite have the. Yeah, and, and I mean, there would be a, and I think. 
this is sort of the, the joy and, and, and challenge of being in the early stages of a project. I think this would be a slightly different project, but the, but that looks really specifically as, and, and perhaps cutting some of the, the people who turn to theatre later, but that look really specifically as, what does experimenting with theatre teach these novelists about the novel form? so that it doesn't actually place the, the plays themselves um, at the forefront and, and in a way sort of takes the reverse approach to, to, to what I'm doing that says, what did it teach them about the novel? What can they do in the novel that they didn't manage to do in the plays in, in that sense? Um, which, which, which I say is the reverse of what I'm doing because I am really interested in the plays, but it's still getting at that question of what do you learn in shifting between two media? What what can one do for you that the other can't and vice versa? Yeah. And actually then someone like Lawrence would, would actually be far more interesting, someone who does balance a little bit more successfully. Yeah. yeah. try to read that is to show how you connected and how you felt while reading it. Hmm. My really woolly answer, and I'm trying I'm trying for this not to be too woolly <laughs> is that it so depends on the project. Um I, I feel I feel bound to say here, and this is because I'm thinking about what we don't talk about. I feel bound to say that right now I'm very interested in um, adaptations or stagings or new productions that don't seem to do very much with the original text and that we might sort of dismiss out of hand as, oh, it's, it's, it's a very straight restaging. And actually thinking about, well, we know that can't be true. You can't literally, you know, you, you produce that play as straight and as loyally as you possibly can. There's still going to be gaps in what you're not told how to do. There's still going to be you know, straightforwardly, what's the difference in staging it now, in this venue, in this city, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is absolutely not me saying that I don't think there are fascinating, subversive reworkings out there as well. Um, so I suppose my answer there is that in a scholarly perspective, I'm more interested in what have we not thought about with the, with the more straight stagings. Um, but, you know, I love a mad, subversive restaging as well. <laughs> Uh, what do you mean by the relationship? Uh, is there like, like a connection or, or because you're, you're, you're working on different things? Mm. Like what's like the One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm working on the hypothesis at the moment um, that a lot of these plays, and that's one of the reasons you might have noticed when I listed them, I think of them in countries. <laughs> One very early thing that, that to me seemed to jump out about these plays is that these writers are turning to the play form when they are particularly interested in thinking about what it means to be part of a nation. I don't think that's at all clear from this because I'm thinking about Pinter's restaging, but, but, but as I said a little earlier, the play is really interested in what it means for someone to leave Ireland and come back to Ireland. And it's a thread that goes across quite a lot of these plays. Um, E.M. Foster's pageant plays, for example, they are a restaging of, of British history, um, they're done in a sort of, you know, village, communal, slightly amateur sense. My hypothesis is that there's something for these particular authors at this moment in time about turning to um, a medium that gathers people together, that sort of literally replicates what does it mean to be part of a communal space. Even if that is a bit artificial, you know, you're not actually a, you're not actually a family, you don't actually have a connection with someone just because you've sat in the auditorium with them, but there's a sort of embodied version of what does it mean to, to, to receive or to, to, to relate to someone communally. Um, that's one of the threads at the moment I'm seeing across the place. Um, ask me in a year and I might have a completely different answer for you. <laughs> but it, it, it's hitting at that question of again, why the medium? Why the shift change? Why turn to the theatre there? Yeah. I don't have anything interesting to say. <laughs> just, there are interesting things to say about Beatrice. Um, for, for context, Beatrice being the other other woman, <laughs> the woman who Richard, the husband, has been sort of carrying on a, a kind of a kind of affair by letters with. 
I suppose might be a way to, you know, and th that's not explicitly romantic or, or erotic that, that I remember. Um, but again, when he comes back to Dublin, it becomes this question of, oh, hang on, is something is something going to happen between between us as well? Um, to me, and again, it, it's primarily because of what I'm focusing on at the moment, I am really interested in the relationship between Bertha and Beatrice, which is, I think, one of those things that, that complicates what could be a more straightforward reading of Bertha that sort of goes, oh, what a terrible representation of, of this submissive woman in the play. The, the way that um, Bertha and Beatrice actually end the play with, with quite a profound moment of connection um, and that doesn't kind of lean into to women fighting over the same man and Bertha having won in that sense. That, that's, that's the bit where I'm quite interested in Beatrice. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll end that with a sort of dot dot dot. <laughs> Any questions from my M one students with questions from uh, assignments? <laughs> Find a question as an assignment. So now's the time. <laughs> Too shy. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned your. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that one. Give me a moment. The, this isn't this isn't a very direct answer to your question. I'd like to think more about it. I think one of the whew, one of the interesting overlaps there, and I'm thinking very specifically about the terms that I'm playing with in in this chapter, is thinking about the really convoluted lines of family and family inheritance there so and and for, for those of you who, who haven't read it which I imagine is, is is several it's not it's not even easy to to get in publication um Will's play Freshwater stages um it's really complicated to try and explain one of the secondary characters is Wolf's great aunt um Julia Cameron who was a a, a very famous um Victorian artist and photographer, a uh, very early photographer, um, who sort of opens the play and, and is a clear line all the way through, um, but the hero of the play is, is Ellen Terry, a very famous Victorian actor. So we're, we're looking at sort of real people. There's a, there's a family connection in that um, Wolf is staging her great aunt, and this play sort of sits, um, you know, th that play is a more complicated version of failure because Wolf never Wolf does not want that stage. That's a coterie performance. She stages it um, with her friends, with the Bloomsbury group for their own entertainment. So it, it, it's, it's a sort of odd version of that. That doesn't sit within a kind of narrative of failure. It's just not Wolf being a, a, an established playwright in that sense. So again, there's something really intriguing about that mishmash of um, staging your family embodying your family, you know, not just writing that, but then performing those roles, and the fact that that play is, is, is again, literally embodied, is played by that incredibly complex hierarchy of the Bloomsbury group, and who is sleeping with who, and who is married to who, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually, it's one of those plays that, that has had a, a remarkably more successful afterlife um, in Europe, in, in particular, in, in terms of restaging there. I think that would be the place where I'd go to think about that that version of, of where those dynamics lie. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you. No more questions. Um, I think it's time to thank you again for a very tiring two days <laughs> and a great thank you so two much. presentations. <laughs>